The other day I was reminiscing about binging Avatar The Last Airbender with my old high school friends. I remember this one time like seven years ago. We were all at Target and I saw this big complete set for the entire show on sale for $30. And I was like, dude, what if we all just watch it together? Like, all of it. And well, that's exactly what we did. We spent the next couple of days just watching every single episode from start to finish. I'd wait till they'd get off work and they'd come over to my house all smelly and we'd just keep watching it. And that time was amazing. It's precious. Is a core memory for me. I mean, I hope they don't watch this because they just laugh at me, but it really was a great time. I just remember how each episode hit for us. No matter how many times we watched it growing up, the emotion never faltered. It always remained as impactful as it had to be. The journey, the characters, the music, nothing wavered, nothing gave. It stayed one of the most beautiful shows any of us could have watched. And still, to this day, I feel the same way. The Last Airbender is a near-perfect animated show, and I don't mean that lightly. In almost every episode, you are given a masterclass of storytelling, action, comedy, music, and world building. And yet for years, the forces above, the great moguls, the tyrant commanders that soar above our tiny beings, they've been trying multiple times to adapt this show into live action. To take something so stunning, so expertly crafted, and remove the mystique, remove the barrier that the animation realm separates from our fleshy, real-life reality. Ugh, gross. You see, I didn't want to not like the show. I really didn't. I saw how good the One Piece show was for the fans and how much they all adored the changes and how it didn't detract their enjoyment of the original in any way. And I blindly gave myself a little hope for a while, but then I saw the clips the conversations, and the signs, all of the signs, that this would just not be the same case at all. You see, I'm trying to be a more positive person these days, which might only last for a couple months, but hey, but who would I be if I didn't make a video talking about this at all? The Last Airbender just means so much to me and who I am. For a show that was so vital in my enjoyment in this world for many years, for a show that gave me many messages to take to heart for as long as I live, how could I just ignore my desire, my need to express that in a time? Time when I don't feel like expressing myself much these days. See, for no matter how much the new show wanted or desired to be as good as it could on its own, it would always lay inferior to the original. I mean, yes, it's certainly not as damaging or disrespectful as a movie that came 14 years before. 14 years, holy crap. But this much more tries to remix, as they call it. Not to be a one-to-one -one recreation in a live-action format, but instead modernize it. For a show that doesn't really need modernizing. The new show attempts to give us slightly, ever so slightly, different takes on the characters we've all come to love, but all while missing what made the original story so incredibly special. In a lot of ways, the newest adaptation is incredibly lackluster, and while watching it, I struggled to find the feeling inside of me that the original produced. Instead of being brought into this magical fantasy world with joy, horror, laughter, and a perfect childlike feeling, instead, all I felt was disappointment. The brightly lit adventure journey to save the day with a ragtag group of kids who are all forced to grow up is all replaced with a slightly edgier, darker, and more depressing tale. And not for the way of making the themes and message more impactful, but instead just missing the mark of why the original is so good and treating it more as a generic tale of good overcoming bad. There's no subtlety no gray lines. Characters aren't complex anymore, or given enough time to view every side of them. Instead, it's all cut down for an 8 episode event. Not a TV show, but an event. An overpriced, overbudgeted event that somehow attacks the visual senses despite each episode costing more money than any of us will see in our lifetime. Sometimes the show looks pretty good, with cool set design and fun costuming. Other times, it it just hurts. It just really hurts. I don't know why adapting something from a cartoon means that lighting just shouldn't exist anymore. The bright, colorful skies of the original are replaced with dark, depressing clouds, because God forbid a show look brightly lit anymore these days. I will say that this show tried. It tried as much as it could. I can see it in the production, the cast. I can see that they were trying, but the final product ends up being a bastardization of the original. Everything is overexplained. Everything is rushed. It takes the entire book of the cartoon and rips out everything that made it special, all while trying to replace it with lesser story moments that only diminish the impact of everything. So what they choose to remove and replace just feels like an odd choice. One that doesn't make it a different take, 
but a worse take, a dumbed down take, an overexplained take. For this video, I just want to compare the first episode of the Netflix show to the first three episodes of the original cartoon, since they follow pretty much all the same progression and story beats. If I went through each episode one by one, this video would be nine hours long and would never get made. So a quick little recap of what Avatar is. There's a boy named Aang, who's the Avatar. The Avatar is a guy who can use all four elements to keep the world at peace and be the hero. Fire, earth, air, and water, those are the core elements, right? There was this attack by the Fire Nation a hundred years ago during a comet, and they took over the world with force and tyranny. Aang's been missing, but he comes back, and he's just a kid, and has to learn to get better at being the Avatar, all while his friends around him learn how to help him and save the world and become better people overall. Everyone in the original has a beautiful arc. I mean, everyone. It doesn't matter how small, how seemingly insignificant, each character is treated with such care and passion that by the end of the show, you feel like you genuinely experience a lifetime time with them despite only being a year in their lives. Episode 1 of the original begins with a small intro from Katara's voice. It's not the iconic intro where she says Aang will save the world. No, because at the beginning, at the start of the show, she does not know who Aang is. For just 30 seconds, she tells the story of the Fire Nation and their terror and how the Avatar is missing because we, the audience, have not met the Avatar yet. In the context of the show, he's not automatically here because we have not seen him make his return turn or be found yet. Remember that. Remember that very point. Ah dang, wait, my Google Docs just froze because my web browser is slow and sucks. If only I had a good web browser. Oh wait, there's Opera. Opera is actually the browser I use daily and have been for years now, so I'm grateful that they reached out to me for this video. Opera is the fastest, safest, and smartest browser for everything that you do online. It's fully built for privacy and security with a built-in VPN and ad blocker, so you can have private browsing with no extensions needed. Opera even has tab islands that stay grouped together based on context so you don't have to hunt down your 400th tab of Iro drinking tea pictures because they're all neatly grouped together. Aria is also an easily accessible companion in the sidebar giving you real-time information instead of having to hunt it down for hours. I personally love using Opera for the battery saver on my laptop. Other browsers tend to drain your battery rapidly but Opera's built-in battery saver works perfectly. So download Opera and make web browsing more efficient and secure. I I seriously mean it when I say that Opera is my favorite web browser of all time. Now back to the video. We then open with our lovely main duo, brother and sister, Sokka and Katara. And in these first five minutes, we see who they are perfectly, setting up both characters and their initial motivations. While both fishing for the village, we see Katara's desire to use her water bending, but not fully being able to yet. We see Sokka's slight disdain towards bending and how badly he wants to prove himself to be capable as just a guy without any bending. We see his arrogance and we see her curiosity. It all shows us in a natural conversation and a simple moment of fishing for the village. They don't over explain who they are or what they need to learn. Now let's go to the adaptation. We don't open with Sokka and Katara. Instead we open with an earthbender spy finding the plans of the Fire Nation wanting to take advantage of a comet to conquer the world. Oh that's a that, that's a change. You'll see that throughout the show we don't learn alongside with the characters. We don't venture through this world world, finding new info or details about what has happened before or what will happen. Instead, the adaptation strips the storytelling in favor of a chronological timeline, showing each moment of history in the saga one by one, to explain thoroughly to the audience what is happening without any imagination or curiosity to be had. It plays out literally like paint by numbers. Instead of starting with two characters who will follow forever who will help guide us through everything in this world, opening with a more aggressive and generic way of storytelling. This is where we first see the bending, which is okay. It's decent looking, the CGI can miss sometimes, but I'm not too thrown off by it. It's cool to see moments like this where you feel a visceral urge to rip the ground up, but then I struggle to find more moments like this specifically throughout the season, and bending starts to become stale. Yeah, bending becomes stale, a show about bending. It doesn't feel like the well choreographed martial arts dance back and forth that made the original so impactful. Instead, it's just like toys clashing against each other with particle effects.
text. People are just fighting. There's no style. There's no beauty. Somehow it feels more cartoonish than the actual cartoon. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We then see the old Fire Lord Sozin and him explaining his plans of conquering the world with the power of the comet. All explained to us outright from the get-go. It makes this Fire Lord who committed terrible atrocities and wreaked massacres across most of the world just feel like this random villain that is so stupidly evil there's no other way to look at it. To end this opener we move into an intro that explains even further what we just saw and what it all will cause and that there's only one hope and his name is Aang. Oh here's Aang. We, uh, hello nice to meet you. We automatically have to know who Aang is. The small reveal of Aang in the beginning of the show with the iceberg none of that matters for a newcomer learning with Katara and Sokka in the first episode. No we will know here because he's the hero he, he, he just is you know just like whatever and then oh boy I'm sorry I'm sorry for getting so mad but then they cut to the air nomads they show everyone alive everyone happy they show Aang going throughout the temple showing before the massacre in Aang's life this is a terrible way to introduce him and it really breaks my heart but I'll get back to this in the original we follow their fishing moment until they get stuck in a current that leads them to get stranded getting stranded leads them both to argue and Katara's emotions leads her to uncover a huge iceberg it's a great moment that shows Katara's power and how much weight they both feel day to day in natural dialogue. The iceberg emerges and it's insane. It's glowing, it's huge. You can see two ominous figures inside, one of who opens their eyes with a glowing glare. It's amazing. But this doesn't scare Katara off. She just thinks that there's a boy inside who's alive and rushes to save him, hitting the ice and having an insane amount of light explode into the sky. This is where we cut to Zuko, one of the greatest characters in fiction. And Iroh, another greatest character in fiction. Zuko, who is clearly on a hunt for this avatar thing, overly obsessed. His uncle, who is chilling with some tea, helping his nephew, but being cautious about the signs of the avatar because they've clearly been duped before. Also, this beautiful, subtle touch of him placing an air nomad symbol on the card that he's playing while wind gusts underneath, showing that this time is different. Back to Aang, emerging as this terrifying force. Who is he? What is this kid? He falls down and Katara holds him and here we meet, we see, we find out who Aang is. Will you go penguin sledding with me? He's just a kid. He doesn't care why he's here. He puts off the real questions. He's just some kid who the first moment he opens his eyes in the series shows us that he just wants to be a kid. He just wants to go be a kid immediately. Why is he here? How did he end up like this? These are incredible questions that juxtapose with this little dork being in this insane situation. Now let's go back to the adaptation. Aang floats around, acting like a kid, but more with a pompous attitude. We don't have any curiosity for who this kid is because we're just meeting him like this already. We are meeting him in a moment of his life that is a small glimpse of joy and then immediately after he is already told to get focused and be on track, that he has a lot of work to do and can't keep goofing off. There may come a day when you wish you'd spend more time with your teachers. So we meet this random kid named Aang, who is important because we're being told he is, further emphasized by just a moment later, where we meet someone else telling him that he needs to be told that he is the Avatar. Did you tell him? It wasn't the right time. We get an entire scene explaining how important Aang is, how much of a prodigy he is. We are just simply told that, not shown naturally, not revealed through questions we get from meeting him. No, we're just told. That, that, that's it. The simple storytelling is reduced and dumbed down, overly explained and overly emphasized. And you will continuously see this throughout. Aang is told he's the Avatar and runs away. That, that's it. Then the Fire Nation does their attack. We see them all massacred and killed. We see everything go down. Aang does not. But us as the audience has to see it before Aang does because we're being treated like we're too stupid to learn what happens with Aang. Aang in the heat of his emotions gets trapped in a storm and imprisons himself in an iceberg unknowingly after entering the Avatar state for the first time in his life. Wow. Back to the original and we see this goofy kid avoiding the core situation. He casually shows he's an air 
airbender with a huge sneeze that sends him way up into the air in a fun way. Appa, who is the most adorable animal you will ever see in your entire life, is with them, and they all swim on his back to go back to the village. Sokka, very doubtful and cautious, and Katara, immediately fine with all of this. The introductions are perfect. We're meeting kids at the start of their journey. It's introducing a lot of questions to be rewarded with answers later on. Soon, Aang falls asleep and has a dream about everything that happened to him. We see him in a storm, falling in water and forming the iceberg around him while glowing in the Avatar state. What happened to him? What led him there? Why did he do that? It's so much more interesting for it to play out this way. When Aang wakes up, he doesn't mention this and glosses over it, moving on to simply meeting Katara's village. But let's go back to the Netflix show. We start in the village, it's much more grand, much bigger. In a way, I like seeing the village more in all the people, but there's still a lot here that really irks me. Katara practicing waterbending and being told by Sokka that she shouldn't because it's bad. You were waterbending again, weren't you? Don't worry. No one could see me. They explain all of it to us. They explain why she likes bending. They explain why Sokka feels this pressure all the time to be the responsible one. They tell us everything that we need to feel rather than doing it naturally. They go down the water trail until they hit the iceberg and get stranded. Katara looks at it slightly cautious but is unable to see anything inside. She just focuses on the boat and instead tries to get it back. And then the iceberg just seemingly explodes with light. I think the show tries to have us be like, oh her waterbending close to it triggered it, but it's not translated well and comes across very anticlimactic because they just see the iceberg and then they just look away like, oh whatever. Now another small change is having Zuko see idols next to him light up, showing that the Avatar has turned. I'm not mad about this at all really. It fits with Zuko basically having alarms near him at all times to show him when the Avatar has returned. It's a slightly better change than just having him see light luckily outside. I do hate the conversations between him and Iroh though. Once again doing the same thing of telling us why it's so important to Zuko before we have to learn it on later in the show. In a cartoon he does this but he doesn't go into insane explanation of why he has to do it. He doesn't literally tell us every single detail before we're able to learn it. And Iroh here is not not the supportive wise uncle of the original. Instead, he's just some doubtful jerk uncle who keeps watching his nephew be disappointed, but he's with him many ways. Iroh in the original keeps his nephew in check, but teaches him ways to look at life and keep going forward with a positive outlook. He keeps him strong, but has massive heart. This Iroh is just some uncle who says cryptic motivations sometimes. Katara and Sokka see Aang at the top of the iceberg standing and glowing, but not in a terrifying way, more just like sleeping and standing. Like, Bro is just snoozing, and well, Aang doesn't wake up here. No introduction between Katara and Aang already, no seeing him immediately childlike and only focused on fun he's just still asleep. But when he does finally wake up back at the village, is with the dream of the iceberg and nothing but doom and gloom instantly. And we already know why he's in this iceberg. It already showed us everything at the beginning. So wow, this is so uh, interesting. And when he wakes up, he's on his own to go out and meet everyone. No one's there to help him. It feels very alienating to how we first meet him compared to the original. Aang is no longer this guy that we have to see focus up, lock in, be the hero that he's forced to be while facing it with fun, smiles, and goofy moments. Here, he's a depressed boy forced to be this hero and that sucks. It just sucks for him. He's then forced to explain his entire life and backstory to the whole village, telling them about air nomads, telling them about where he's from, and they just relate to him that they're all dead. Just outright ripping the band-aid off. Hey, all your friends are dead. All of them. Sorry, bro. And so Aang is depressed, distraught, downright sad. Look at him, bro. <laughs> Look what they do to my boy. He's so sad. Meanwhile, let's check on Aang in the original. The grandma in the village says, yo, it's crazy to see an airbender. We thought you were all gone. A seemingly small but incredibly simple way of conveying to the audience, wait, what happened to the airbenders? Why are they all gone? Something's up. What happened? But then just going along with still building our characters while we're meeting them before just barraging him with depression, Aang flies around with his glider to make the younger kids laugh and smile. He takes Katara penguin sledding and has a great time. Katara doesn't even know he's the Avatar yet. She's just happy to see another bender in general and naively thinks that he can help her learn. We also see Sokka pushing to act more responsible from being the only older dude in this village. While in the live action, who is Sokka? Who is he? He's, he's just like here. There's other teenage guys that could handle their responsibility. Sokka is nothing. I have no idea who either of these people are in their introductions as compared to seeing so much life from them in their animated counterparts. Aang and Katara explore an abandoned Fire Nation ship and it adds to the mystery of their brutality and power, building an image of them slowly not just for us, 
but for Aang. And then the first episode ends on Zuko closing in on the village, sure that he's found the Avatar. In the live action, they go to the ship, Aang indirectly teaches her some bending tips in an awkward way, and the way the scene is blocked by the director <laughs> is so funny. Bro is just staring off in a distance and it looks like he just accidentally walks in frame like, back up buddy, ba yo back up! We see nothing else from the Fire Nation ship because, well, Zuko's ship already showed up. He he's here. He's here. Alright, whatever. In the second episode of the original, Sokka doesn't trust Aang for leading the Fire Nation to them, overly protecting everyone because he's too scared and forcing himself to be responsible because he's the only one that can because everyone else is either too old or too young. He tells Aang to leave and faces the Fire Nation ship head on by himself in a goofy cartoon way and it's so fun. In the live action, it's Sokka and his whole crew against him. Sokka is not on his own and has a lot of backup support, lowering the emphasis of what this kind of moment represents. They also, here's the best part, they also just casually tell him that he's the Avatar in front of Sokka and Katara, just like this, in a, in a casual conversation. No interesting reveal or anything, he's, he's just the Avatar, he's the savior. Yep, yo, he's here. Zuko torments the village in his own childish, unintimidating way, and Aang shows up on a penguin to cutely save the day in making everyone smile. And here, here is where Katara and Sokka learn he's the Avatar, told by Zuko, this terrifying force in front of everybody. And as Zuko attacks, he scares the village. Aang sees the fear in everyone brought on by the fire and immediately surrenders himself to Zuko, showing us for the first time that this kid knows what's up. This kid has that hero in in him, that good heart for others. It didn't tell us, it showed us, and Aang is captured and taken away. Back to our lovely live action, since they know he's the Avatar, Sokka gets mad at him for abandoning the world and banishes him. When the world needed the Avatar the most, he vanished. Because he's a coward. He ran and people died. A much more bitter take than being a little scared of new changes that he's not prepared for. Instead, he's angry with a mistake that Aang made at a young age. It's a much more cynical view of Aang's iceberg moment. Something that Aang himself overcomes throughout the series to make up for disappearing on everyone. Instead, this live action show countless times in just this season has characters just angry at him for leaving and shaming him more than anything. So we're gonna take a detour for a moment and talk about Boomy. Boomy and the entire Omashu series is one of my favorite moments in the entire story of the original. We meet an Earthbender King who plays tricks on our crew, putting them through games and challenges, importantly putting Aang through the ringer. We wonder why is this king doing all this? What's leading them to go through this huge game? Well it's all for Aang to figure out who he is like a puzzle and how he's his old best friend, Boomy. The reveal is adorable and happens at the end of the episode. The king does a great job at keeping him unaware and we see this super old guy who still acts like a huge kid. Instead, in the live action episode, Aang meets Boomy and knows it's him from the beginning. And the entire episode is Boomy messing with Aang because he's mad at him for leaving. And then at the end, he's like, You think like a child. Is that really so bad? That's so terrible. That's so terrible. Boomy becomes a significantly less interesting person, someone that's just a bitter friend who stays bitter at the end, even when he's slightly forgiven him. The show makes it its mission to have all different takes, but they're just more depressing without any joy or wonder that the original had. The original episode ends with Aang and Boomy doing their favorite thing they grew up doing together and riding down a hill in a huge transport cart. I love it. And here, they do the same thing, but force it. It makes no sense for this version of Boomy to act like this suddenly when you've seen how he's become just a bitter old man mostly. The charm is lost. So back to the first episode and Zuko breaks into the village. He fights with Sokka one on one and instead of letting it be Sokka's one moment of bravery and responsibility in this episode, Aang shows up and tells us. I think you're the bravest person I've ever met. Okay, so now Aang is captured, talks to Iroh for a moment where Iroh explains why the Fire Nation took over the world, because yeah, we also need that broken down for us in case you were stupid about that too. And we see Aang escape and wander the ship, taking things that Zuko has written down about avatars. In the original, when Aang is captured, he doesn't even make it to the cell. My boy is raw, he's cold. With his hands behind his back, he uses his mastery of airbending to literally break free in a huge swirling fight that encompasses tight corridors and excellent 
excellent choreography. I mean, just look at this. It's wonderful. It's stunning. Aang's restriction allowing this fight to be even more creative than you would ever think. How did Aang escape a cell in the live action? He lifted some keys from a guard's pocket. That, that, that's pretty lame. It's not creative. He could have just grabbed those and been sneaky. What makes this specifically incredible with airbending as opposed to him confidently showing off his skills with his hands tied behind his back? Tell me, which of these do you think is better? Aang makes it outside where Katara and Sokka reach him with Appa, which just so happens they know how to make him fly. In the original, there's an incredible moment where Aang alludes to how to make him fly with a certain word, and Sokka casually says it, leading for this beautifully satisfying moment of Appa finally flying for the first time in the show to save Aang. Here, it's just a comedic cut. Aang then flies away on his glider to Appa, but is hit out of the sky where he's grabbed and saved. Zuko sends a fireball to Appa, and is deflected by Katara, hitting it with water. Okay. In the original, Aang beats Zuko's ass, slamming him against the walls and embarrassing him mostly in a head-on fight, emphasizing Zuko's insane commitment being so personal by also just straight up losing against this kid. The moment he almost beats Aang, Aang falls into the water going deep down where, inside of him, it activates the Avatar state. In one of the most hype moments I've ever seen, this man lunges out of the water and wipes out half of the ship's crew gracefully. This moment shows how powerful Aang can be in this state and having its first moment happen from a similar situation as when he formed the iceberg, Mwah. perfect cherry on top. Aang fates and Katara and Sokka save him by teaming up and Katara uses her bending a little clumsily but still clutching and freezing the Fire Nation soldiers and is so sick they work together here. And as Zuko sends one fireball away, Aang takes one last adrenaline filled moment to deflect it into the snow, encapsulating the ship entirely in snow, further making Zuko feel like a failure and fueling him for the rest of the show. He's seen the Avatar, he knows what he's capable of, the power he has, he's determined to be the one to capture him. You know, before he has redemption arc, it becomes one of the greatest characters in fiction because he learns that capturing the Avatar means nothing to him and he doesn't have anything to prove to his father and he could just be a good person on his own. You know, easy work, easy work. Zuko's just the best character ever made, but you know what I mean. Here, Zuko meets Aang, sees him fly away, and is just like, oh yeah, I, I wanna go get him. I, I, I need him, my honor's on the line. <laughs> you know, like whatever. But wait, to emphasize how badly he needs needs to pursue Aang, they'll just tell us. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. That's so much better. They're just going to tell us why he needs Aang so badly. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> and here's another one of the saddest changes from the original. The moment in episode two where they're flying away, the colors are muted but calming. The music underneath is heartbreaking but hopeful, and Aang expresses to them how he didn't want to be the Avatar. In one simple moment, it shows his sadness about it all. It shows his guilt, his despair, and it's beautiful. But this isn't who Aang is because in just another moment he jumps up in a smile, determined to learn and be the avatar that he needs to be, but disguises his emotions while wanting to go on detours like finding hopping llamas and surfing with oarfish because he's an adventurous kid. It's adorable. And Katara talks about learning to bend and Sokka's excited to fight some fire people and you have your entire crew's journey set up perfectly. Oh my god, it's literally amazing. It's so amazing. And the first episode of live action does not end like that. When they fly away from Zuko, they talk about how they can't go back to the village, so where do they go? There's no beautiful music, it's really ugly looking, I'm sorry, but this lighting is awful. And in the next shot, they're at the air temple. Oh, and god. I am sorry, but this makes me so upset. It makes me so upset. In the original, you get an entire episode dedicated to Aang's ignorance about everyone he knows being dead. Katara tries to softly tell him that they've heard terrible stories about what's happened to them. Aang is joyfully glossing over all of it and flies into the air temple. He even says sweet innocent things to Appa like, We're home, buddy. We're home. And it's just, it's so good. It's so good. Aang goes throughout the temple looking for everyone. We see Aang activate an airbender door and it's so cool. It adds layers to the world building, having specific access for specific benders and those who knew how to use them. I mean, come on. And this is where we see Aang talk about his master and how fond of him he was. We get an adorable flashback of the master being firm about his responsibilities as an avatar, but then goofs off with him because he is still just a kid and they throw cakes at other people and it makes their friendship so strong and adorable and 
as we cut back, it's just so heartbreaking because we don't know what happened to him yet. We don't know where he is. In the live action, when they land, it's just straight up all laid out on the front door. I mean, all of it. Aang shows up sad, and this is just like a place. This is not the air temple where airbenders were airbending. This is just a place that got destroyed by the Fire Nation because it's all just front and center. What about this makes this an air temple other than that it's on a mountain? Wow. Cool. In the original, Aang and Sokka chase Momo because Sokka wants to eat him, but Aang just playfully chases, you know, because he wants to. As the chase continues, Aang comes across a terrifying sight on his own. Corpses of firebenders laid out in front of none other than his master, who tried his best to fend them all off. This ominous, terrifyingly drawn scene, these incredible framework of corpses before the master at the end against the wall, it's genuinely a perfect shot. This is the first moment that sets the tone for what the show must follow. The stakes of their journey, the weight of his abandonment, it's all so beautifully done here. But in the live action, it's ruined. It's bastardized, for he just walks up to his body just laid out on the ground like another corpse amongst the others. In the animated version, Aang is broken, his friend is gone, he truly sees that for his own eyes for the first time, and in a burst of emotions lets it all out and enters the Avatar state in his most powerful moment yet, alerting the entire world of his presence and return. His friends, his only kind faces that he's met in this new world, do their best to talk to him and comfort him. Both of them them, being there for him when he really, really needs it. In the live action, we see him break down crying after finding his body and they show us flashbacks from stuff that we saw earlier in the episode about him telling him how important he was, not moments where they're bonding together and having a moment of friendship, no, just lecturing him and telling him, telling him that he was his best friend, not showing us, telling him that they were friends. We don't get to see them actually be friends, they just tell us. And that makes Aang so angry that he goes into the Avatar state and Katara and Sokka don't talk him down, telling him that they're family now. They just yell his name and watch. And Aang just thinks it all through until he calms down by himself. That is so awful. That is so unbelievably awful. And it makes me so upset. Aang tells us, tells us, tells us, tells us, tells us what he has to do for the rest of the show. He gives a description of the narrative from the start to the finish. He reads the wiki like a trailer. He's a character in the show and literally describes it all to us plain, stupidly simple. I need to follow through on what they wanted me to do complete my training, and master all the other bending skills so I can bring balance back to the world. And boom, episode's over. Good luck with the rest of the season. The third episode of the original ends with Aang contemplating the beginning of his new life. His old one now lost. He thinks about what must happen next. He looks back as they fly away and the music underneath beautifully closes us into the credits. And you get to sit there and take it all in and what that moment represents to Aang in the rest of the series. You don't get that in the live action. You don't get any of this in the live action. All of this is just a fraction of the awful changes. They aren't takes that try to make the characters better, they aren't changes to improve upon the original and add more depth, more interesting ways that we never got to see, they aren't adding anything of value here, and it's so disappointing. We don't get to see our favorite world and characters look like real life. Instead, we see hollow shells of what those characters were. There's so much more meat, more sauce, more layers upon layers in the first hour of the original cartoon versus the first hour of this adaptation. There's nothing that got me excited to watch the rest of this show because they told me what would happen. If I never watched the original, I would be so insanely insulted to watch this for the first time. My literal education is questioned when I'm being told every motivation, every plot point, future plot points, character stories, and flashbacks. I am being shown everything in chronological order because I'm a dummy, not being able to create questions and pay attention long enough to have them answered. This show makes you feel like an absolute idiot. You are an idiot who couldn't understand the cartoon for Nickelodeon, so why don't we dumb it down for you? Remix the more confusing parts and make it easier for you to pay attention, dummy. It's so, so insulting. The reason I'm so passionate, once again, is just because how beautiful everything is told in the original. The style, the music, the voice acting, the animation itself, the literal storytelling of beat by beat by beat, it's all leagues better. This is a depressing take, a different take, because it's depressing. It wants to be sadder, darker, more mature. But for why and for who? The cartoon captured plenty of dark themes and moments and did so while being 
a cartoon. It has moments of goofiness that made you laugh, hilarious character action and faces. It kept the joy and wonder that you felt when watching a handcrafted cartoon. So why when adapting it to live action are you forcing it to be without any heart? No joy, no wonder. No small moments that make you appreciate what this world is or little glimmers into how it operates. No smiles on characters' faces in the darkest of times. Why does making it live action mean that you have to lose everything that made the original so impactful to young and older minds alike? The reason that all those people who grew up watching it still rewatch it and feel all the emotions all over again. The only benefit that this show has is funding and fueling a desire for future animated avatar projects. There's a lot planned for the future and I'm I'm really pushing them to get made and continue the story in the medium that it's strongest in. Avatar The Last Airbender is once again one of the greatest cartoons I've watched and one of the greatest stories of our generation and it did all of this while being animated. Anyways, thanks for listening.